What's that? Welcome to MMA Fancast. My name's Luke, and I'm joined today by Cody Gamble. Cody, welcome to the show. Hey, how's it going? I'm glad to be here. It is good having you on the show. You have a fight coming up for 247 Fighting Championships May 22nd. They're doing a double header on the same day. So tons of fights, tons of opportunities, and you're getting back in there. You were last in the cage in November during their double header show around Thanksgiving. And so I know it might not be the best way to start the conversation, but let's start it that way. Anyhow, what did you learn or take away from the fight in November? And how have you been training since then to get ready for this fight in May? I'm um, just working on my uh, entries um, into my shots, uh, working on my striking a lot, a lot of focusing on my striking, being more relaxed and stuff. But Sure. That, yeah. I mean, makes a lot of sense coming out of that fight and, and what was it like in that fight you certainly were not you didn't lose badly I mean it was a it was a no. tough fight the guy was what six eight six seven yeah something like that yes and so like you're saying the entries and learning some stuff but you definitely persevered well it ended up being a decision so what was it like going to that level um even though it was a loss you know you fought all the way through the uh, the fight there, and what type of experience was that for you? Uh, the type of experience of, of it, like, probably the most I took away from that fight is I need to fight. If I fight a dude that's, like, 6'8", which I will again, or somebody that tall, I'm going to need to find a sparring partner with that reach, hmm. you know? I got to get comfortable with that reach and sparring. And I, I had people I had people tall, like my height, like 6'2", I think yeah. the tallest person I sparred during that fight camp was 6'4". But I think the reach is a huge thing to get adjusted to um, when you, and you're sparring for your fight camp. So if I fight someone that tall again, I'm definitely going to have a sparring partner it, like with that build. Sure. Well, that's a good takeaway right there, given as you continue in your amateur career and look to pro as well, getting that understanding of what, you need is important as a heavyweight a lot of fighters are in the six feet to six two range i mean you, you got up into six four when you talk about steven mojic but then obviously dc cormier is i think a very liberal 510 um and yeah so yeah so like there's a lot um but i remember when and if you watched any of the fights of stefan and Str skyscraper struve no i haven't you haven't watched any of his? No, I have okay. not. Okay, so at, at some point, it may be good for you to watch. Just, uh, he's, I think, pretty much retired now, but he used to fight in the UFC, he's seven feet tall, and he um, he lost to Roy Nelson, who's your size, and a bunch of other fighters beat him. He was, he was good, but never like that good. But one thing is that they kind of laid out the game plan, um, just free things for you to look up online. Roy Nelson and a couple other fighters, um, Mark Hunt, I think he also lost to Mark Hunt, who's a shorter stock, yeah, big stock power. So check out some of his fights. They figured out a game plan that worked against a very tall opponent. So, But as you look forward to May 22nd, um, what's your mindset coming in this fight? How excited are you to get back in the cage after November? I'm super excited. Um, I was supposed to have a boxing match uh, at the beginning of March or middle of March, and the guy pulled out. Just a bullcrap reason. But, you know, that's what the fight game is. You know, you just got to keep on staying positive and wait till, like, you know, you get a you get a contract set and, you know, the guy shows up and, you you know, you're out, you're, you're going to fight, you know. Like, it sucks. It sucks when guys pull out. But it would be a good experience for me for that boxing match. But I'm excited because, you know, this guy signed with me for May 22nd and I'm going to show up and I'm staying positive and I'm going to do my best. May 22nd. That's a, that's the right mindset coming into that. And the amateur world, I'm sure it still happens in the pro world, but the amateur world is just filled with, like you said, crappy excuses. Yeah. For, for not doing stuff. I remember once this is in Allentown, Pennsylvania, there was an MMA fight. I was there as a coach and my, my fighters fight happened. So that was good. But we were mm -hmm. there. Um, and during weigh-ins, a guy didn't show up. And we found out that he didn't show up so you could go make like 20 bucks mowing grass 
instead of fighting. But it was wow. one of those, yeah, it was one of those things that it was like there was nothing holding him to it. You know, it's an amateur fight. It's yeah, a it's cut weight, made weight, but there's nothing. And that's actually why for those that are listening, they may so- feel the word contract seems a bit strange in amateur. I think Ryan does a great job using it. To your understanding, what does the contract for 247 do since it's not money-based, it's amateur-based? And um, are you kind of excited to have some guarantee when you sign, guarantee to a degree when you sign that Correct. contract? Yeah. Is, is that something that you like having the contract? Have you fought fights where you didn't have a contract? Do you think that's a good thing to have in amateur MMA? Yeah, I think, I think it's good to have the contract for amateur MMA. Absolutely. I think it's, I think there should, I think there should even like be consequences for even amateur MMA. If you do not show up, unless it's like a funeral or you have a physical injury where, you know, you got a doctor's note, you know, where you can't participate that night and fight, you know, or compete at all in anything. I think it should go with like big jujitsu matches, pro fighting, obviously amateurs. I think it should go for all that because a lot of, I mean, not every amateur, maybe guys want to just stay in amateurs and like, you know, and they, they just want to enjoy themselves and get out. But some guys want to make a future out of it, make a living someday. So. Yeah, absolutely. And I know the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania under Commissioner Serb has at times thought about that. Do they do a punishment where the person is that is banned from fighting in Pennsylvania for maybe six months a year or something like that? And I think as MMA really picks up again and there's two fights on the same day for 247 and there's just tons of fighters and yeah. you, I know you know this I know Jim Mooney the matchmaker he has double the number of people that want to fight than than he can match and so at some point there's people that want to fight um, if other people don't want to but when you talk about having a future plan and we always want to look ahead at the fight in front of you and not skip it but where would you like the fighting game to take you uh down the road um so i'm only 20 years old i started in this back in uh 2020 in march started i just uh went in my first cage fight as a tough wrestler and uh got a tough you got a double leg and there's a high rule so i hit him in the face and then locked my hands around and got a face crank didn't even know what it was but just locked my hands around and that's what I did. I was just a tough wrestler coming in, but it's were the best. You, were you in mount? Was it more like? A, were you in mount? Was it more like a can opener? Were you just, or did it you? It was just literally a gable grip, and I ran my forearm across the, gotcha. across the face. You just did but, gable grip. Okay, cool. Yeah, mm-hmm. I did that. But uh, anyways, I so anyways, I was like, I fell really in love with it, and I worked at the I worked at the pipeline at the time, and uh, I had my. Uh, guys I worked with there and my boss of the pipeline and stuff like that. And I was telling him, I was like, I really like this. I think, I think, I think I'm going to take off with this. So I ended up hooking up with uh, Robert Meese, which is my boxing coach. And he knows like Isaac down here, Greeley, my uh, mentor, one of my mentors. And then like uh, Dom and Dempsey and Warren Stout and uh, Will Morrill and all them great coaches down here. But uh, it got me hooked up with these guys, and uh, Isaac has me an apartment right upstairs from the mat factory, and I'm 20 years old and living upstairs above the gym. <laughs> That's, I actually was going to ask life. you for that because while we were on the video, you were walking from the gym to an apartment. I was like, it looks like it's attached, like it's one yeah. connected thing. Yeah. So yeah. You're, you're, you're living what is a lot of fighters' lives, you know, living – above the apartment i i've interviewed Mm -hmm. a a great 185 pound champ a professional cffc champ from philly who actually lives up in canada and he's living i think he's 26 or 7 he's a pro champ looking to make it to the ufc but he's living in his coach's house while we're interviewing him and he's already fought and won i think he's i don't know Mm -hmm. 10 and 2 or something so it definitely takes a dedication and a mindset I also have to ask you, I know that you didn't have any uh, fans in person in November because of COVID, but I have have heard that you have quite the crowd behind you. People love watching fights. So talk about that coming up to May 22nd. 
as far as how your tickets are going? Are people excited to be able to be back in person to see you fight live again? Yeah, they're so excited. I'm from uh, Harrison County in Ohio, and um, I, could, I go home like once in a while because my boxing cl- coach lives back there, so it makes it nice so I can go back home and train a little bit too. But uh, my fans are literally so excited. I have the whole entire county like supporting me. Like it's crazy. Like that's where all my sponsors are at. It's from that area. I have a few up here in Pittsburgh too. But um, the, those guys, I'm telling you what, them Harrison County guys, when they come in, that they're, they're they're like they're like in the fight with me. It's crazy, you know. I I love I love where I come from because it's just the biggest support ever. Well, it'll be exciting to have those Harrison County guys live. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The convention center. It's going to be great. I think it's so exciting to finally kind of appreciate. So let's talk about that. You had one fight where there was a crowd all around you and they were going nuts because you won by neck crank. And then, then you had another fight where there was maybe 20 people in the building um, Yeah. because of it. So what's it like fighting completely quiet venue versus a crowd and kind of what's what are you looking forward to? Are there some advantages to having a quiet venue? Kind of talk about that. Because you had a very unique experience that some fighters are going to go their entire career and never fight to an empty uh, stadium or an empty building. Yeah, it was completely silent. And it was very weird, um, very weird atmosphere. Like Because like I wrestled since I've been 11 or 12 years old. And I'm 20 now. And like every competition I've had, in wrestling, there's always a huge crowd there, a huge support group there. It just, you know, it makes you kind of feel more comfortable, you know. It makes that, it, like, that adrenaline rush, like, that bad adrenaline rush go away when you – because you find that comfort with, like, your support group. And it was very – yeah, it was very weird. Um, I did not I did not like that part of it, the silence of it. But, yeah, it's going to be I, – I love when I'm, my crowd comes, for sure. It's – so much better it makes it makes perfect sense another incredible fighter in the heavyweight division from ohio uh independence ohio i believe steve Miocic. you know you may yes. have his name um he said because his i think it was his third fight i think his third fight against dc the trilogy fight against dc was a completely quiet um you know nobody was there and uh he was interviewed later about it and he was saying basically what you we're saying that it's like he feeds off the crowd. And while it was probably his biggest win, or if not one of his biggest wins, defeating DC in the trilogy rubber match there, that it was hard to get excited about it because there was no crowd. So for people that are watching this, crowds do matter. I think even at the highest yeah. high where there's 50,000 people or where there's 1,000 people or 800 people, it makes a difference for the fighters. And I'm glad there'll be a crowd there. And I'm glad you'll be able to have your Harrison County people coming into this fight. What do you want to see from yourself without giving game plan away? What are you looking for progress wise in you as a fighter, Cody? Um, uh, just probably, uh, like, uh, you know, taking my time on things and, you know, picking my shots, which it's whatever, if it's, you know, if the takedowns there, you know, the overhand lefts there, you know, my hooks there, like, you know, just being more relaxed and, uh, you know, being more smart in the fight, you know. Well, sure. It's tough to be relaxed, not only in a fight, but you're still fighting, to my knowledge, in the in the novice rule set where it's yeah three two minute rounds. Uh, what do you think is an advantage when you get to go longer rounds? What- uh, my cardio is amazing for heavyweight my cardio is amazing for heavyweight and uh that i think that helps out like my first fight in ohio there were three three minute rounds and you can ground and pound to the face right. like that's that i say the two minute rounds i mean it it is what it is but like i just hate how you can't ground and pound in the face in pa until your third well was it your fourth fight or something like that i yes. think so but you know the rules are the rules, so you got to respect them. So. Yeah, absolutely. You you bring up something that I always try to educate people, particularly if they're watching from a different state or don't know. Pennsylvania has three MMA levels. the The highest level is pro. That's exactly what you see in UFC. 
That's what you see in Bellator. It's pro. It's all the MMA you think of. But the lowest level is the novice level, and that is no head kicks, no knees, no uh, no knees to the face, no elbows, yeah. and obviously on the ground, nothing above the clavicle. You are legally allowed to drop elbows and shots, including knees, below the clavicle. I did see a fight at the amateur level stop years ago from a guy who got in the cross body or you know cross mount position and held his opponent down and kneed him over and over again in the side, and that led to a TKO. But typically, there's not a lot of finishing on the ground. And then what you were alluding to, Cody, is what they call the advanced amateurs. They take off the shin guards, which is great. Mm -hmm. Still no head kicks, still no knees to the face, still no elbows to the face. But what you're talking about is that they are allowed closed fists to the face, so ground and pound is in. And you mentioned it. It is You have to have three fights, and they have to be a winning record. So two and one. Right. Or three and oh, like what you were alluding right. to. So, um, how much are you looking forward to getting into a fight where you can have ground and pound again? Particularly if you win this fight, then you're two and one, then you have the ability in Pennsylvania to do the advanced amateur. Is that a big deal for you coming up? Yeah, I think it's a huge deal. I think it's a huge deal for anybody that started out with grappling as their background, like wrestling or jujitsu or anything, because, like, you know, you open up the submissions I feel I strong I do strongly feel with the ground and pound you know where you're not worried about you know you can hit them in a the body and then you go to their head hit them in the head now you got them worried about their head you know now they're worried about their head body all this kinds of stuff where they're hit where you're hitting and then there's Americana Kimura or whatever you know so yeah absolutely how much in the amateurs I've seen it in the novice I call it the X defense where fighters on the ground almost look like they're in the casket right they do mm -hmm. this and as you could probably imagine this is not effective in a real fight no absolutely <laughs> not yeah and that's why yeah. like the ufc or any any pro level you go here on the ground and they either turtle up and get tko'd or they come here maybe two shots and then they have to do something there's not right get an underhook get up yeah, yeah. underhook get up uh hold them whatever and so I do think it leads um, to unrealistic defenses on the ground because this will literally never work. And granted, it's effective in the novice rule set because you don't have a lot of space to hit if they're doing this, but it's obviously not effective long term. Without giving any game plan away, what is your dream submission? I know at the pro level, like Twister has only happened like two or three times the UFC. There's a couple other random submissions that, uh, like the banana split and a couple other ones that don't have yeah. enough. As a heavyweight, heavyweights are not necessarily known for submissions unless you're uh, Alenic, Alexi Alenic, um, mm -hmm. that, like the record number of submissions and he's pulling off Ezekiel chokes and all types of crazy stuff. But if you could, in your mind, pick like a crazy submission that you'd love to hit um, on somebody, and I, I've had Jimmy the Brick Flick on this show, and he hit one of the only flying triangles in the UFC in his debut, which was pretty exciting. But, of course, he was 125 pounds. But if, right. if you could hit a submission that's out of the world, what would it be? It would probably be a, um, a heel hook. A heel hook. Yeah, yeah. Could, you imagine, could you imagine two guys fighting 265 pounds and some heavyweight pulls off a heel hook? You know, that'd be crazy. That, that, no, that's, that's high level heavyweight grappling right there. It is. You pull out a heel, heel hook in MMA fight. So well, that would be, that would be definitely a dream one right there. That is a dream. And I hope, I hope Cody that at some point down the road at, at, you know, at the heavyweight limit against another big heavyweight in an important fight, I hope you pull off the heel hook. That is reminiscent though. When you talk about, high level heavyweight grappling obviously frank Mir comes to mind he hit a knee bar on brock lesnar which is which is a big deal and then he broke his right. arm uh, That's with a, with, yeah those are huge submissions that are a little unusual for the heavyweight obviously guillotines and rear nakeds and uh yeah. high triangle jokes stuff like that happen but as far as what so how much time have you spent kind of and i know frank is now i believe in bellator but he's somewhere but Watching a big heavyweight, do you go back and watch Frank's fights? Do you watch any big heavyweights fights that like jiu-jitsu? Is that something you're looking at? Yeah, I watch Frank Mir. I've watched him a good bit. But, yeah, I've watched that that fight with Brock Lesnar about 
five million times though, because that's just pretty sweet knee bar though he got on Brock Lesnar. So, what do you think made that so sweet? I have my idea, but there it is. Obviously, MMA, all the weapons are on the table. It's Brock's big, huge fight in the UFC. Hits his knee bar. What do you think was nice about that from a setup position as a fellow fighter? Well, it's kind of. I felt like it was kind of weird scramble when he got into it, but like I feel like. It was nice because like Brock felt comfortable the whole time. And when he got it, when he when he finally locked it in, then Brock Lesnar's like, oh crap, like I'm in a bad situation. I was feeling comfortable the whole time, you know. Cause yeah, he had I think I doubt he probably practiced any like, you know, getting out of heel hooks and like, you know, knee bars and stuff like that in this fight, the Brock Lesnar's fight camp then, you know. But it, it was it was cool, though, how he set it up, because I do feel like he felt Brock felt comfortable the whole time until he locked it in, obviously. Then Brock found out he was in a bad situation. Well, yeah, and, and Brock tried the hop defense, which it turns out hopping is not the defense to the knee bar, although right. he gave it a shot. But what, what I think is cool about that from Frank Mir's perspective is a lot of people don't have active off their back. They might think they do, but he – he had this monster towering over him who was reigning, who was in this posture standing, reigning. And that's a bad position. That's like the perfect ground and pound position. And I think uh, Frank showed that control matters. And Brock did not have control of him, even though he was standing over him and had a better position. Frank was able to kind of twist, get him. Right. And it really shows what an active off your back looks like. So right. obviously that's just really cool. Shop talk there. Hopefully somebody enjoyed our shop talk going into this right. fight. Let's talk. Let's talk about predictions or mindsets. I always want to give people the opportunity to kind of call their shot. If you want to do the Bambino or if you don't want to, that's cool too. But I always give people the opportunity. Yeah. Do, you have, oh. do you have a shot you want to call coming into this fight as far as a prediction goes? Um, no, I mean, anything could happen in a fight, but I'm very confident in my abilities for this fight. Absolutely. But I, you know, anything could happen. So certainly. And part of the reason why MMA is the exciting sport it is, is because there's so many ways to win. And that's what makes it like you were just talking about hitting a heel hook, hopefully down the road. There's so many ways to win. That also means that there's that number of ways to lose. And a lot of times, when people do lose, including even Fro Brock Lesnar, we were discussing, it can be a bit of a shock. And so clearly you're keeping your mindset right. You're focused on doing what you can control. You've already mentioned cardio. You were a wrestler and you are a wrestler. Um, how important do you think it is to control your cardio, knowing that that's like the one thing you can actually outwork in an opponent? Um, the control it. Uh, I mean, I don't know. I'm always like gas to the pedal, though. Go, 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 go. You know, um, I feel like it gets my, you know, mentally because like you get once you're physically drained because you're you're out of shape or whatever, you're not en enough in shape, you know, then you're, you know, mentally you start to, you know, start, you know, ma making bad decisions in the fight and stuff like that. And, you know, putting yourself in bad situations. So I feel like with my great cardio, it makes me mentally sharp too throughout the whole fight. That's a, that's a big part of it, right? Because when you have cardio, your brain can still think when you don't have it, your brain, when it's loss of oxygen is in survival mode. And we've seen people make mistakes in fights they would never make, but it's because they were gassed. Their brain cannot make those good decisions because it's just in a survival mode. So um, I appreciate you taking time to come on. Let's look at your um, gratitude list, your shout outs, your thank yous. You mentioned sponsors from uh, Ohio. So who do you want to shout out as we um, kind of look at your, um, your interview here coming up to the May 22nd fight? Well, I want to shout out to all my sponsors. I have a good bit of them, but you guys know who you are and you know, we have the MMA Tea Co. company that uh, has all your your guys' logos on my shirt. And I'm sure all my fans are going to be wearing that shirt. Uh, 
uh, Saturday, May 22nd. So I'm very excited about that and probably going to get a big group picture afterwards. So it'd be cool. Um, want to say thank you to that, my family, uh, my friends. Uh, I'll care about you guys so much. And uh, just thank you for, you know, keep on believing in me and, uh, you know, and supporting me. So. Well, that sounds like a great shout out for those that don't know, check out MMA T company, John Brennan um, from the Lancaster area of the other side of Pennsylvania does a great job there. And it really gives fighters, both pro and amateur opportunities to get their brand out there. Uh, what does, what is your setup? What, what does it look like as far as the shirt goes? I want to keep my eye out for what color is it? Let, let's plug the t-shirt a little bit more. <laughs> okay. It's green and black. It says right here on my chest, it says the incredible Cody Gamble. And it has like a Hulk fist on it. Yes. And, yeah. And then it has all my sponsors on the back. Cause I never had a nickname and like John Brennan and all them, all them were asking like, well, what are we going to put on there? What's your nickname? It's like, I never had a nickname, but back in school, they used to call me Hulk. And I was just like, well, they used to call me Hulk back in like high school, you know, which wasn't that long ago, a couple, you know, 2019. So I was just like, they used to call me that. It was the only nickname I really had. And he's like, all right, we'll do something with it. And he did something with it, and it looks freaking great. So, Well, and when you're the physique you are, it makes perfect sense. So I should have yeah. introduced you. I should have introduced you now as the incredible Cody uh, Gamble. So you are the incredible Cody Gamble, and I'm looking forward to watching you fight May 22nd. Thanks so much for coming on. Can't wait to see you in action live yeah. at the Moroville Convention Center. For everybody looking for tickets, get tickets from fighters. Check them out. Get tickets. It's going to be great to be back live for MMA. Thanks so, Thanks so much, Cody. Yeah, thank you. Bye. Have a good one.